Today is Tuesday, July 14th. This is a post-market review for the stock market activities today. You are looking at a heat map of how the market ended today. It's mostly in the green, some red pockets in the technology sector and banks because of banks' earnings that we saw today. The technology sector was quiet and muted throughout the day except at the end. The majority of the gains we saw were in the healthcare sector, in energy, and industrials and materials. If you watch today's market activities since the morning, you might be a little confused. And the media is putting a false narrative here that today was a shift between technology, the momentum, versus the laggers, aka the value. It is momentum versus value. We shift from one to the other every day. The truth is that the market has been overtaken by gamblers and these gamblers are now confused. They don't know where to put their money because the shift between momentum and value was making sense until we saw the earnings from the banks and from Delta. One day the Nasdaq is up, the other day is down, the Nasdaq is down and other garbage names are up. And they do that yo-yo game over and over again. Today, they tried to do that. First, they bought the technology names. Apple, Tesla, Microsoft were catching a bit in the morning. And the weaker name were muted. And as we saw throughout the day, they shifted to the weaker names like Delta and the Cruises and other names while technology went down. And then they reshifted again their bets to technology while the names, the travel names and the weaker names went down and stayed muted. But that was not the story of the day. The story of the day, yes, it started with the rotation back and forth trying to find a footing here. Those are the gamblers of the market. But the real players in the market made a strong move that we haven't seen yet. The shift, the real shift today was into yield hunting. Throughout the day, companies and sectors with large yields gained momentum. Throughout the day, they never stopped. There wasn't a rotation back and forth. You can look at the chart. You can look at the charts. The leaders of the Dow were energy companies, Chevron, Exxon, big dividend plays. You can see the leaders here in the Dow. It was Caterpillar, Traveler, Chevron, Exxon, McDonald's, United Health, Dow. It was the weaker names quote unquote, but they were the large dividend players. You didn't see the typical rotation where travel names catch a bit and technology is muted. That wasn't it. Today was a yield hunting day. We'll go through that in details when we look at the charts. And of course, at the end of the day, we saw technology names like Apple and the rest of them catch a bit because of short covering, panicking at the end. The weak shorts panicked at the end and started covering. The last thing I will say about this before moving on is, yes, the media keeps saying it's a rotation between momentum versus value. But if it was that, then why was the semiconductor names that are already overvalued catching a bit throughout the day and then other names travel like airlines and cruises and casinos were muted even though they're value. So there's a disconnect there and I know what it is. It's yield hunting versus the gamblers shifting all over the place. And that will settle down eventually. We don't have headlines today. There were headlines about China and all of that, but that's been happening and going on for years now. So there's nothing new there. Some Fed personalities started speaking throughout the day. That might have helped the market at the end, but it's still uh, insignificant. So we're going to look at the bank's earnings, headlines for the bank's earnings in Delta instead. And then we're going to shift to looking at the technical analysis throughout the day. And then we'll look at what to look for tomorrow and the reminder of the week. Okay, the one to watch, and I told you that, is Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo was a disaster. Wells Fargo reported a loss for the first time in a decade. This is a bank the third largest bank in America, and it's losing money. How could you lose money if you're a bank? I mean, you have the money. They still lost it, like the casino lo losing the money. It doesn't make sense, but that's how weak Wells Fargo is. They reported a loss of $2.4 for this quarter. The revenue was $17.8 
much lower than expected. They also slashed their dividends much lower than expected, 10 cents a share. And I'll read you here the statement from the CEO, Charlie Scarf. Is that how you say it? Charf? We are extremely disappointed in both our second quarter results and our intent to reduce our dividend. Our view of this length and severity of the economic downturn has deteriorated considerably from the assumption used last quarter. This is very important to listen to because here's a CEO of a bank telling you what's going on from the inside. Continuing which drove the $8.4 billion addition to our credit loss reserve in the second quarter. So the bank is becoming weaker. They, they're using the reserves. They have to because they don't have any avenue to stabilize their financials. This bank has a history of mismanagement and engagement in risky behavior, and now you're seeing the fruitation of all the bad behavior that Wells Fargo was involved in in the last decade. The architect of this disaster is former Wells Fargo CEO John Stumpf. This guy looted the bank, looted the company, wiped the slate clean, and he walks away with $130 million. Shouldn't this guy be in jail for what he's done to Wells Fargo? But this is the kind of crony capitalism we live in, the system. They get in, they loot a company, they get richer, they walk away, they leave shareholders, employees, and other executives holding the bag and dealing with it. This is criminal. This son of a bitch should be in jail. Now let's move to GP Morgan earnings because, as you've heard, they had good earnings considering the situations, but there were slight warning signals there that you have to pay attention to. There were things that were not mentioned in the media. All they said all day long, wow, look at the... GP Morgan earnings, they were great, they overperformed, etc., etc. But they didn't tell you specific details, so I'm going to tell you those details. First of all, let's talk about Jamie Dimon, the CEO of GP Morgan Chase. This guy is worshipped like some hero in the media. Remember, he was the last man standing from the financial crisis in 2007 2008, which the banks had a hand in. He's the last CEO who's continuing his tenure all the way here. He's touted in the media as some hero. But remember, this guy was the last one of the banksters who created the crisis. They sold the Fugazi mortgages to customers, giving them homes. They gambled with the money. They lost. We, the taxpayer, bailed out the banks. And what did they do? They repossessed the homes. They did a foreclosure, kicking the families out of their homes. And they repossessed the homes. It is a win-win for them in this scam. They gamble, they do all the bad behavior, the taxpayer comes to the rescue, and they collect their assets right back, like nothing happened. You press the reset button, and you come back with more immunity and ammunition. How great is this scam? And of course, Jamie Dimon takes a knee, and everybody always says, oh my God, what a humanitarian this guy is. Instead of taking a knee, Jamie Dimon, if you want to help black people, how about take some of the hundreds of millions of dollars that you have and compensating the black families that were kicked out of their homes because of the ba- your bank's bad behavior. They were the victim of the J.P. Morgan Chase and other banks' bad behavior. And it's really interesting in the media, CNBC specifically. When they interview this guy, when they have an interview with this guy, he's like the second coming. They talk about him all day before the interview. Oh my God, I have an interview with Jamie Dimon. What are you going to say? What are you going to tell him? And then after the interview, did you see my interview with Jamie Dimon? What's such a great guy? He's Look at his his hair. How did you see his hair? His tan. How about his tan? Oh my God, his tan. It, it's absolutely ridiculous how they worship this guy and they never say anything bad about J.P. Morgan. But here it is. Let's talk about the numbers. The earnings for J.P. Morgan. The revenue was $33.83 billion. The earnings per share were $1.38. The net income was down 51% because they had to move $8.9 billion into reserve. That is very bearish. That is a warning signal. Why is J.P. Morgan the best performing bank in the country moving 8.9 into reserves. They know this crisis is not over yet. They know the worst is yet to come. 
and they're preparing. They have a huge war chest. That's granted. They can withstand this problem for a while, but not for too long. Because remember, the revenue number that we got from JP Morgan, beating expectations, they never included how much they got from the PPP loans scam. Remember that JP Morgan processed the majority of the loans. That's why the number are great, not because of the business itself, but because they processed billions of dollars worth of PPP and they collected fees. They collect fees for processing our money back. They collected billions of dollars. The details of how much PPP money they got were never released. I want to read you this statement from Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase. He says, this is why we can continue to serve all our stakeholders and pay our dividends, right? He's now referring to the, the, the billions of dollars that we, they have in reserve and their cash positioning. But here's the warning signal. Unless the economic situation deteriorates materially and significantly, meaning if this crisis continues for a couple more quarters, even the best bank in the country will not be able to hold. You're going to see J.P. Morgan Chase turns into Wells Fargo, and God knows where Wells Fargo is going to be. The credit card sales volume was down 23%. Where is the V-shaped recovery if customers are not using the credit cards? Loans down 7%. Deposits up 20%. It shows you that the consumer is very careful, very worried. They're putting more cash into their accounts and they're not spending. How will the economy reach a V-shaped recovery without the consumer participating in that recovery? Is the Fed just going to continue to throw the cash from the helicopter and that will supposedly recover the economy? Think again. Now we move to Delta's earnings. Delta was an absolute disaster. There's no ways to sugarcoat it here. The revenue was $1.2 billion down 91% from last year. Absolutely disastrous. They reported a loss of $4.43 per share. That is lower than expected. The total loss amounted to $4 billion. The net income was down $2.8 billion. Guys, here is a company that also the best name in the airlines in terms of financials. And it is a zombie company for all intents and purposes right now. So you can imagine what other airlines companies will look like. But this company specifically, based on the numbers, they're surviving on bailouts and Fed money. They're a zombie company for all intents and purposes. I'll show you right here. Last year, the company lost $11 billion. They were struggling before the crisis. But now they have $15 billion in debt. They raised $15 billion in debt, effectively compensating for all the revenue that they lost. But you have to remember that debt does not compensate for revenue, really. It goes into your sheet as cash and cash equivalences, but it does not compensate effectively for revenues. It does not compensate for operational margins. The company is still losing money. Of course, 5.4 billion of that 15 billion debt that they raised came from the so-called CARES Act, aka taxpayer money. They also say that they have an option to raise a further 4.6 billion from taxpayers. We continue to bail out this company. The Fed continues to pour billions and billions and billions of dollars into this company. All right, so we effectively compensated for all the losses that they got this quarter. All the missed revenue, they got in debt. Fine. What's gonna happen next quarter if this crisis continues? How are they going to compensate for the losses for the next quarter? Well, they're saying they can raise another $4.6 billion from taxpayers. That's not going to be enough. And then the Fed, will the Fed give them more money at that point? Will it be worth it to give them more money? There are turbulent ways waiting for these airline companies. If this is the best managed company in the airline industry, and it's effectively a zombie company floating in taxpayer and Fed money, and if this continues for a couple of quarters more, they might not survive. What about the rest of the industry? Let's talk about the technical analysis for the day. This is a daily chart of the SPY, S&P 500. And of course, 
I told you how the day started by the rotation back and forth and then the yield hunting that was effectively going on throughout the day. I'll show you that in the charts and I'll show you the last short covering that happened at the end of the day in the technology names. Here is a 15 minutes chart of Delta Airlines. They started buying Delta in the morning and then they dumped it, tried to buy it again. That's the, rot the second rotation and then they stayed flat for the most part. Contrast that with, for example, Apple. Apple started in the green. It, it caught a bit right away, and then it got sold as investors started shifting the weaker name, the rotation, and then it caught a bit again, the reshifting to the, to the technology names, and at the end of the day, short covering, panicking for people who short here, the weak short, so couldn't withstand one green day, and of course they tried to short the, to cover their shorts at the end, shooting these names higher at the close. Here's Tesla to prove that this was not a momentum versus uh, value rotation. This was something different. You see Tesla started in the green and started selling off as the weaker names, the deltas and all of that started catching a bit. Tesla was sold and then the re-rotation. Tesla got bought and delta and other weaker names got sold, and now it ends in the flat range that you see right here. Because the the gambling crowd from Robinhood who are shifting day to day are confused. They went with one side of the market first, then the other one again, and then they stayed flat, they're confused, they don't know what to do, and they let the yield hunters and the shorts take control of the market. The shorts covered at the end of the day, Yield hunters continue to push and pour into yield-bearing stocks. Here's the proof for what I'm saying. Cat, Caterpillar, big yield, over 3%. Bought from the beginning, and they continued to buy it all the way to the end. We see a similar story with McDonald's. McDonald's catches a bit from the morning all the way to the end. This is the yield hunting, so it is not momentum versus value. Of course, I already done my yield play. I recommended that you guys buy Kroger stock about a week ago, and I bought Kroger. Kroger is my yield stock, and it's my only long position. Kroger had a good day, 2.88% gain. It shined all throughout the day. You can see from the daily chart of Kroger, had a big day and will continue to thrive because it is a growing company during this pandemic, but also have great cash positioning and great dividend over 2%. And that's why I thought that it's going to be the safest place to park my money. And I bought Kroger and I recommended that you guys buy it too. Furthermore, here's a chart of the TLT to solidify my theory of the yield hunting day. They were buying bonds. They were hunting yields all the way to the end of the day. There was a big pop in the TLT. It started selling off a little bit at the end as we saw the short covering happens in the market. And now we move to one of our favorite indicators, the VIX. The VIX was down big, over 8%. It reversed some of the, its gains. It started in the green and reversed throughout the day as the SPY was catching a bit. It is still elevated from its natural course. We had a down day, a big green day, and now we gave a little bit, but we're still above the candle here, the green candle. We're still closing in its upper half of the body of the scandal. It could be that we're, all what we're doing here is down, up, down, and then shooting back up. We will see the manifestation of this moves in the VIX in the days to come. So let's conclude here and discuss what we should look for tomorrow and the reminder of the week. Here is a chart of the ES mini futures, the SPY, the S&P 500 futures continuous contract. Here's the thing. Today was a mashup, a mix of a lot of things, rotation back and forth. But the statement and the theme of the day that we can take out is today was a yield hunting day, a very different move than we've seen in past month. When investors hunt for yields, that is a bearish sentiment because they want to park their money somewhere. They can't park it in treasuries. The yields are too low. Hey, parking it in names that produces high yield that already reached the bottom, like the oil companies and some of the industrials, makes sense at this point. But it is a bearish sentiment in the market. Otherwise, they would have kept buying technology 
names today. They didn't. Technology names were down from the reversal yesterday. It was an opportunity to buy again. They didn't do that in the morning. The only buying that happened was short covering at the end. So here we are in the futures. This is the reversal from yesterday. We reversed right back today. And now we're still in this battle, in this range. We had a hard reversal right here from this, from these levels. And we had another hard reversal as we reached the top, these double tops right here. We had another harsh reversal. Are we going to try to knock back at it again a third time? We will see, but we need a fuel. The market needs a fuel to blast to the upside. Where is the fuel? Is it more Fed liquidity? Well, we know the Fed is already throwing and flooding the market with liquidity all over the place. How would that change anything? Is it a new government stimulus bill? That could be. That certainly could be, especially if they hand consumers more money, more than the 1200 they did before. That could do it. More bailouts, more socialism. That could solve it. How about another vaccine headline? That might do it too. The other thing is, of course... And what actually the market is doing is waiting for earnings. They don't want to make a move before they find out the full picture of earnings. If earnings don't justify the blast and the break to the upside, all what this is doing is gathering energy. Sellers don't want to sell. Sellers don't want to sell right now because they're like, why would, would we sell if the market keeps going up every day? We'll wait. If the gambler is going to continue to push the market to the upside, we'll wait. We're not going to sell right now. I disagree with that move, of course, but that's the seller mentality right now. They don't want to sell. However, as earnings come and disappoint, they're going to start losing their patience. We've been hanging around this range for a long time now, and we didn't break. And the earnings picture is not getting better. COVID is not getting better. Nothing is getting better. And they're going to come to the conclusion that it is time to book their profits. They will start selling and pushing the market down. The only thing that would save the market and give it the fuel to the blast to the upside is a surprise, an upside surprise in earnings. We have a batch of earnings coming tomorrow. Goldman Sachs, United Health, among others. And we have, of course, Thursday is a big day. Johnson Johnson, Abbott, and Netflix, of course. And then next week is going to be even bigger in earnings. We will have to wait and see what happens with earnings. But I still doubt that it will give the fuel for the rally because these stocks already rally. They're pricing something that's not existing. We saw Delta. Delta showed you the real picture here that, yes, in the beginning of the quarter, things were going a little better going into the course of the recovery. At the end of the quarter, we saw a sharp downturn, a reversal right? This is your indication. This is the indicator that you need to pay attention to. The market and the reports give you signals and give you indicators to follow. It is up to you whether you see them or you continue the blind marsh of buying stocks like the Robinhood gamblers are doing. That is up to you. But the way I see it from the earnings that we had today, from the banks and Delta, I see warning signals. I see the economy reversing back. I see it catching a little bit of a breather in the beginning of the second quarter, and then things turning worse. So I remain bearish, and I told you I started a short position. I will keep adding to that short shorting position, but I'll also be cautious to watch for the earnings season, the rest of the earnings season. The more confirmation signals I see from earnings, the more I'm going to short. And the opposite is true. If earnings come a lot better than I thought and the guidance is a lot better than I thought, then I'll start retreating a nip in the bud, my shorting position. But for now, I remain consistent and confident that the earnings are not going to come to surprise us to the upside. If anything, they will surprise us to the downside and building a bearish position is very smart right now. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.